Oh. Listen. Roman, we good on your end? We are good, thank you. We're good to go? We are good to go. Okay. Okay. So. How would you describe your childhood growing up in a small apartment in Flatbush? Um, my parents were uh, a lot older than most other people's parents, and I think that was explains a lot of my childhood. Uh, they, I was an only child. They had me in their 40s, their mid 40s, um, and uh, overprotective is a sort of mild way of putting it. I think they were terrified that something was gonna happen to me, um, like as in being killed or something, or getting sick and dying. They had, had another baby before me that died, and I think as I was growing up, I, of course, not, was not aware that they had been through this sort of trauma, so there was that. There was also, my parents were both children of immigrants, and they were not by any means assimilated Americans. Um, their parents didn't speak English. Their parents spoke Yiddish. A lot of my relatives spoke Yiddish. Um, my parents didn't know a lot of things that other parents of my friends knew. Um, it was just, I have a friend who jokes that I grew up in the 1930s. Um, because they graduated from college into the Depression. They had grown up very poor. And I had two hairbrushes throughout my entire childhood. I remember them, you know. So that is just sort of emblematic of, uh, I mean, my life is now filled with, like, I must have, you know, over the last 10 years, like 70 billion different hairbrushes. But when I was growing up, until I left for college when I was 16, I had two. Um, so, yeah, uh, it was kind of strange. She, they sa saved soap slivers in a, in a uh, washcloth so that you didn't waste. Um, it was frugal. It was very constricted. It was filled with a lot of fear, fear of illness, fear of other people. Other children, you know, had impetigo. They were stupid also. They had bad posture. They spoke with an accent. Um, you know, I had a friend in the building who said, Roz, you want to go to the store with me? You know, and my mother, my parents were in the school system. My father was a teacher in high school. My mother was an assistant principal at a public school. And speaking non-accented English, I mean, well, if you spoke with an accent and you tried to get a teaching license in the 30s, you would not be able to get a license. So speaking correct English was very important. So... There's a strip of yours where you say, I'm Harriet the Spy, Wednesday Adams, Eloise, Carmen Miranda, among others. Who were you as a child? What kind of a child were you? I was anxious. Um, I was a hypochondriac. Uh, I wasn't sure about other children. I loved to draw. Um, I had a weird sense of humor. Um, I was very angry um, and depressed. And uh, I was waiting to get out. I was waiting to grow up. I couldn't wait. Why were you angry? Couldn't stand my parents. Terrible thing to say, but true. You know, my mother was super strict, super strict, very rigid. And my father was a sweet man who just could not stand up to her. So, you know, um, I was just waiting to grow up and get out. Do you think that you were um, depressed because you were oppressed? Or repressed? Or what was the oh, depression about? That's just pressed. <laughs> Every, uh, um, all those things. I didn't like school, and I didn't like being at home. So, you know, that didn't leave me a lot of options. It sounds like you had a lot of fear. Oh, yeah. Still do. <laughs> Can you tell me about that, the way fear came into your life and continues to play a part in it? Uh, my father was the most anxious person I have ever 
known. He was the same way somebody might be a chain smoker, he was a chain anxietier. Like the minute one anxiety would be solved, he'd be on to the next one. It was like opening up a bottle of seltzer. It was like suddenly it would be like, be careful, and you'd go, what, what am I doing? Oh, he knew somebody who the seltzer you know, cap flew off and flew right into his eye and blinded him. So, you know, everything uh, could and probably would end in being blinded or killed or maimed in some horrible way. Uh, so, yeah, it was just a lot of, a lot of fear. And uh, it sounds also like you adopted these fears yourself. They, they couldn't help but sink into your pores. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was, uh, I was terrified of most things, you know, growing up, um, terrified of other kids, terrified of just calamity, you know, happening at every turn. Um, you know, I was very uh, aware of um, sensations in my body, um, like, and, and that is something that <laughs> sadly has, you know, come with me into adulthood of like, I feel the blood in my hands. Like, I can feel the blood in my hands right now. And uh, for a while, I went through a phase of like that freaking me out. Um, now, it's been, you know, like 40 years of being aware of this sensation. So I'm kind of more used to it now. But uh, just, you know, nervousness, I guess, which is stupid. It's not stupid at all. It's just wiring. It's all it yeah. is. Yeah. And what about phobias? Did you have phobias? Tons. Tons, tons. I was afraid of a million illnesses, um, some of which I learned about from children's books, you know, like appendicitis from Madeline, um, death be not proud, brain tumor. Um, there was a, I, somehow I learned that like about mastoiditis, which was something in your ear that could get like an infection or something. I would feel my permanent teeth and they would feel wiggly and I would be afraid that they were gonna fall out. I was afraid of going blind. I was afraid of going deaf. I was afraid of going blind and deaf. I was afraid of like in Helen Keller, she was blind and deaf and then she felt the wall and there was a fire in the wall. And you know, then afraid of the fire in the wall. It, you know, just like <laughs> this kind of nonsense. Were you able to ever enjoy a fearless day? Uh, I don't even know, it's it, it just so much connected to being alive, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your mother wouldn't let you read comics. Yeah, yeah, she thought they were for morons. Um, so how did you come to the world of cartoons? I had cousins. <laughs> um, I had older cousins and uh, and I had, there was a girl in the building who, the same one who was, you know, you want to go stow with me. She read a ton of, you know, Archie and Veronica. I read a lot of those, Betty and Veronica, Archie, Jughead. Um, and my cousin introduced me to Mad Magazine when I was about 11. And loved, loved, loved. I loved things that made me laugh. I mean, that was just like, to read something that made you laugh was like a complete miracle. It was like, how did this, uh, like it's just a, this kind of unbidden automatic response of like, <laughs> you know? And Mad Magazine was one of those things that did it for me, you know? So what then brought you to drawing cartoons? Something about it had to have felt very, you know, you magnetized to this. Oh, I, I loved, I mean, I drew from the time, I can't remember when I didn't draw, you know, from the time I was three and maybe, you know, probably picked up a crayon before that. But I remember drawing when I was three or four. Uh, and I liked things that made me laugh. And I also liked with cartoons how you didn't have to choose between drawing and writing. That I liked to write also, 
but when I wrote without the drawings, it felt sort of lopsided. Um, and when I drew without the words, it also felt lopsided. And cartoons are one of these strange forms where uh, you get to combine them. And it's also a very flexible form where I feel like you can make, you can decide how you want to do it. Uh, if you are the kind of, if, if th it feels best for you to be very, very, very verbal and have just the most rudimentary drawings, then go with that. If you are a mostly visual cartoonist, then go with that. I mean, I think that's why sometimes like learn to draw cartoon schools kind of like I don't understand them because I, for me, I feel like what's so interesting is discovering yourself what feels right for you. Um, and what feels right for me isn't going to be right for somebody else. Uh, so for me, it was, I started to feel like I think this might be the direction I'm heading when I was around 12. But it's so interesting to me that you say this because your, your cartoons really resonate with lots and lots of people. Shakaru. They are <laughs> incredibly funny and yet they're also pretty tender and they can be powerful because they're poignant and um, they tap into a lot of emotions and a lot of those scenes are direct hits from your life. Yeah, yeah, they're somewhat autobiographical but not all, you know. Uh, sometimes I feel more autobiographical than others and sometimes there's like something that comes right from life that's so funny I have to draw it up. I mean, that is a gift that happens every once in a while. I mean, when, I remember when m one of my kids was around uh, 15 or 16, they were doing their homework in the living room, um, and uh, I wanted to just see if they were paying attention, so I came into the living room. They were listening to some music on the boom box, and it was some kind of hip hop thing. And uh, a boombox that tells you how long ago it was. And I just did this kind of mom dance. You know, those kind of like horrible, like there's a lot of like awkward sort of like movements. And, uh, and they looked up and said, Mom, stop. You're hurting me. And it cracked me up so much. I actually used it in a cartoon, which sold. So, yeah. Uh, um. Charles Adams was an influencer. Oh, what did, tell my me love. About, tell me. Uh, well, a lot of reasons. I think back when I was a kid, there was something called like sick jokes, and they appealed to me a lot. Um, there was something sort of jolly and yet transgressive about them, kind of. Uh, I think some people would say, well, this is really kind of hostile. You know, it's really not nice that that man is asking his wife to like back up off the cliff because she's going to fall and get hurt. And it's like, you know, you know that one where like he's taking a picture of her and, uh, and he just tells her like to just, she's like at the edge of the cliff and it's just back up a little bit more. Um, or the one where uh, Uncle Fester is in the car and he's waving the truck driver to pass him on the road. And of course the truck is gonna go right off, you know, the edge of the cliff. Or like Harold dropped the keys, you know, when he's being carried off by, I mean, there was something hilarious and um, hostile uh, that I really responded to. Um, and, but hostile in this kind of hilarious way. Uh, one of the more uh, famous Charles Adams cartoons and also one of my favorites is, uh, it actually has a title called Boiling Oil. And it's the one where the entire Adams family is on the top of their mansion and they have this cauldron of boiling oil and at the bottom there are all these sincere sort of carolers kind of and um, they're about to jump you know, this, they're like gonna dump this cauldron of boiling oil on them. And it was going to be on the cover and then Harold Ross was like, mm, maybe we'll put it on the inside. Um, I guess he, he just felt maybe, maybe that's 
a little too much, but uh, I just love that. Uh, and also, the other thing about Charles Adams that when I discovered him, I was about eight or nine, was that um, his cartoons had children in them. So, you know, Wednesday and Pugsley, they didn't have names uh, when they appeared in the New Yorker. They only got names for the TV show. Um, but most New Yorker cartoons didn't have children. And these were very unusual children. So do you remember when you discovered Charles Adams? Yeah, I do. I was about eight or nine, and my parents, um, they, uh, in the summer, you know, we were living in Brooklyn, and in the summer, my parents and a whole bunch of Brooklyn school teacher, uh, they called it their contingent, um, most of them were childless, almost all of them were childless, and they would all go up to Ithaca, New York, in the summer, and they would live uh, either on the Cornell campus um, in graduate student housing, where it was cheap, and because these were teachers mostly, they didn't have a lot of money, and uh, or in some nearby area, and rent an apartment for July and August, and they would go to Cornell. That was the, the center of their activity. And there were always activities in the summer. There were concerts, there were lectures, and when my parents would do these activities, they would hang with their friends, uh, or go to these lectures, they would park me in the browsing library um, in the student center, which I think was called Willard Strait. And in this browsing library, there was one section that was all cartoon books. And in this section, they had a whole ton of Charles Adams books. They had Black Mariah, Monster Rally, Adams and Evil, uh, The Groaning Board, um, Drawn and Quartered, and I could look at these books till doomsday. They just killed me. I just adored. Um, so, you know, I was one of those many people, apparently my age, who found Charles Adams as a kid, and, you know, that was it. Do you think there was anything about your parents that was a good influence on you? Yes. Uh, my parents believed that you should find what you love to do and that your job wasn't just uh, a way to make money, that, um, that it should resonate with you, that it should have a, a meaning. And I think that they knew on some level that I was probably going to uh, be an artist, but I think that they thought I would probably be an art teacher which is a very reasonable assumption on their part, you know, because to say I want to be a cartoonist, um, it's a little ridiculous. But. Did you ever have that conversation? No, no, uh, we never had that conversation. So when you got to college at 16, which is very young, um, what happened as far as your decision to pursue this? Um, the first college I went to was Kirkland College, which was the girls' school to Hamilton. And I was so young, I really did not know what I was doing. I knew I wanted to do art, and the reason I chose Kirkland was because they were brand new and they had an incredible art department. Um, they had, you know, uh, uh, an incredible printmaking department, you know, photography till doomsday, art, you know, painting, everything. And the good part about it was that um, there weren't, I mean, there were people who liked art. There were lots of people who loved doing art, but there weren't that many people who were, I would say, driven. Um, so I often had um, the facilities to myself, uh, you know, especially in the evening. Um, there was nobody else there, you know, and I could just do whatever. And also at Kirkland, you, you didn't have, there were no required courses. So I could just take, and my parents did not want me to go to art school. That was, you know, so Kirkland, it was like, okay, I'll get my BA, um, but I'm also going to take all art c classes. And then after two years, it should have been one, but I had a boyfriend, blah, blah, blah. Um, I stayed, wound up staying a second year, at which point I was 18, so I was like a normal age for starting college, and I decided to go to RISD, Rhode Island School of Design. And, uh, and then I was with many very driven people, <laughs> and it was a different experience, but good, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you credit your conspiracy for inanimate objects to your mother. Oh, and I think she got it from somebody else. Okay. What is that? A conspiracy of inanimate objects is like when your pen rolls off your, de your desk and then you bend down to get your pen and then you smack your head on the underside of the desk and in doing so you tip over the coffee cup uh, which spills all over what you've been working on. So it's just this kind of Rube Goldberg of like terribleness. So, and that creeps into your life. Oh yeah, yeah. I think that you could say that. Yeah. So your cartoons reflect an entire world of characters and situations. They seem to be, as Adam Gopnik wrote in the New Yorker, quote, an ongoing projection onto adult life of the world where you grew up. Huh. Are you obsessed with your past? And if so, why? Why does it continue to have this grip over you? Hmm. Am I the only one? <laughs> I think that's kind of a, you know, I mean, didn't Fitzgerald say something sort of similar? Uh, you know, you're, you're, we are living into our past. It's kind of, hmm. So drawing from your past is just like, who doesn't? Everyone well, does. We well, all do. There's that. It's also, um, I think you work with what you know, or I do. I draw what I know. I, if uh, I remember doing a, a I, I agreed to illustrate a children's book once that took place mostly in the woods. And when I hit, hit my first like two page spread and I had to draw like these animals that were very cute, but I had to draw them in the woods and it was like, all right, what's in the woods? All right, there's trees. All right, what's on the floor? All right, twigs? There's like maybe leaves, pine needles? There's some rocks? More twigs? Like I couldn't quite, you know, whereas when I'm drawing an interior, like an apartment interior, I could draw like a billion kinds of lamps, a billion, I have like a image bank of everything that's in a house or in an apartment, but like, you know, woods, I, I, don't, I, I don't know, you know, it's pine cone, then the pine cone sits there and it looks stupid, you know. Um, so you draw from what you know. Yeah, you draw what, wouldn't. yeah, you draw, you draw kind of what you know, you know. So when you left home at 16, I just want to go back to this for a second, were you deliberately sort of saying, I've had enough, I'm getting out of here as fast as I can, and here I go? Pretty much, yeah, yeah. I knew I was not going to, I mean, I had to after I got out of college, I had to live at home for a little while, but um, I couldn't wait, you know, to get out. Mm -hmm. When you return home or visit Flatbush, after you leave, after you've left it, were you ever nostalgic? No, no, I didn't. I didn't. No, um, it was depressing. Uh, I didn't have nostalgia for that. So finish this sentence for me, if you could repeat it and then finish it, please. Um, sure. You know, when I look back on my childhood, I see a person who was. When I look back at my childhood, I see a person who is waiting to be a grown-up. And when you think of the histrionics of your home life there, are you still haunted by their voltage, by their power? I'm sure I am. I'm on some level. Uh, it's not something I think about all the time, mm -hmm. um, thank God. When you had your own children, what did you want to make sure you did for them that hasn't been done for you? Oh, like everything. I think I wanted to make sure that uh, when I had my own kids that I would figure out a way to not make them hate me, to not um, fuck it up so badly that by the time they were like 12, I didn't trust them. You know, they didn't trust me anymore. 
I just didn't want to fuck it up. Um, I wanted, my mother said to me many a time, you know, when I was upset about something, um, I'm not your friend, I'm your mother. And I deeply felt that there was a way of being a parent and also being a friend. Um, and I just wanted, I knew that at some point they were going to be grown-ups and I, and I didn't want to have the same relationship with, you know, my kids as I had with my parents, or I didn't want them to have the same relationship with me as I felt with my parents. But, you know, to kind of cut them some slack, they, they were, there was such a gap, you know, age-wise and also um, just orientation to life-wise between me and my parents. And I think it was less so with my kids uh, for many different reasons. Um, you know, economics, language, uh, the fact that my parents were first generation Americans, um, you know, how hard their lives were compared to mine. Uh, you know, World War II, I mean, all these things that they went through that I just didn't have to. So, you know. What was it like for you, Roz, when you um, moved to Ridgefield, which is a pretty leafy place? When I moved to the suburbs of Connecticut, it was definitely like a sort of um, the fish out of water genre. Um, for one thing, I didn't know how to drive, which was really bad. Um, but I had insisted that I was never, there was no way I was going to live in a place where I couldn't walk to town. So we lived in town. We live in town, which is nice because I can, you know, walk into town to, you know, get a quart of milk or go to the library or just a mental health walk where I can see stores. I don't want to see trees. I don't care, you know. Um, a tree, I don't know the names of them. They don't mean a lot to me. I like looking at shop windows, you know, that's kind of fun. Like somebody made a little arrangement. Maybe I'll go in, maybe I'll touch a shirt, you know, I'll see the different color combinations. Somebody designed this. I like that. Um, I even like going to CVS and like seeing the arrays. I like the, uh, I like going into the store and seeing the sort of the insanely hopeful and hilarious, like these potions. It's like this, a spray calm yourself spray and you know these vitamins that are going to make you smarter and you know this kind of basically snake oil kind of stuff but it cracks me up it's funny um it it, it amuses me more than like just taking a nature walk which you know makes me sad um because i get tired i get very tired and bored and cranky but walking in a town i don't feel that way um, so, uh, yeah, so not knowing how to drive what I had to learn, um, when I was in my thirties, um, and that was really awful. And I'm still, I, uh, not, I would not say I'm like a full driver. Like I have my license. I mostly drive locally, although I did drive to Amherst, not to brag, uh, this past weekend. It was a little scary. It was the second time I've done that. I got honked at just once. Um, but that was, you know, that was a big step. But I'd never lived in a house, and houses are weird. They make noises. When something goes wrong, you can't just call the super. I don't like that. Um, there's things like roofs. I don't like basements. I don't like the pipes when you see them. Um, I don't like the boiler, or we don't have a boiler. We have something else, I forget. I don't like when it bangs. I don't want to know about that. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Um, places that are trying to impress me always scare me. They don't impress me, they just scare me. How would you describe your beginnings as a New Yorker? Was that scary? No. No, the New Yorker was, it was quiet. It looked old. It was a little bit grubby. Um, it looked like people were doing what they wanted to do, like writing. Um, the fixtures, the light fixtures were the same as my public school. Um, it wasn't loud or like show-offy, like 
we are really modern and, you know, we really are up to date on, uh, you know, nobody looked like that. They weren't aggressive looking. Everybody just looked sort of basically plain, like they were working on their things, and I liked that. How did you get to The New Yorker? When I got out of RISD, um, uh, I uh, drew cartoons for myself. Um, I just, I wanted to. Um, I, that's what I did before I went to RISD, and it's what I did, you know, I just, um, I stopped while I was at RISD for a while because it was just thought of as like a kind of very bad thing. Um, this was a long time ago. This was a while ago when cartoons were very much like, because um, they weren't really art. And, uh, you know, you were doing that incredibly embarrassing I can't even say it, thing of like trying to communicate with another person, which is very needy and, and, and pathetic, really. You know, better to have like a video monitor with like a lot of static on it and then write like 12 pages about like, you know, architectonics or something. Um, but like cartoons were really, you were trying to communicate with other people, which is sad. Anyway, I, I, got out of school and I was drawing the cart I got out of RISD and I was drawing the cartoons for myself but I thought nobody is going to like these they're really weird they're not they don't fit in anywhere um they don't look like anybody's cartoons um I don't know what they are uh I'm going to put together an illustration portfolio um and the I cooked up a style that was a sort of pastiche of the styles that I saw around Little Milton Glazer mixed with a little bit of this, mixed with some like RISD artiness, which was a kind of like, you draw, but you make it look sort of sloppy. Because, you know, also like drawing like exactly meant like, you know, your work looks kind of tight. You know, um, like ugh, this drawing would be better if you kind of like scribbled it more, um, like made it like really loose and like smeared it. I know this is wobbly. Um, anyway, um, so there was that. And I got a few jobs. And uh, then this is just one of those weird things that happens. When I was about 23, I was coming home from taking my portfolio around, picking it up, illustration portfolio. And I found an issue of Christopher Street Magazine on the subway, on the D train opposite me, and I thought, should I pick it up or should I not pick it up? Should I pick it up? Should I not pick it up? And this voice in my head said, if you pick it up, it will change your life. So I thought, okay. Now, you know, when you're 23, this is not, you know, things, you, you, things happen like this. Um, so I picked it up and they used cartoons. And it was kind of, Christopher Street was not, it was not a gay porn magazine. It was kind of like, a gay literary magazine, but they used cartoons. And they seemed to have three different artists, which I found out later um, were all the same person who drew in three different styles with three different names. And they were like New Yorker cartoons, except they were slanted gay, so it'd be like two guys, you know, but businessmen or whatever. Um, and so I called them up and he said to come by, and I was still living in my parents' house, this apartment at this time, and I met him, and they started buying cartoons from me for 10 bucks a piece, which in 1978, or 77 actually, was still crap pay, but I was selling cartoons. And I thought, this is interesting. I'm gonna keep doing this, and you know, to hell with the illustration, which I hate anyway. Um, and I started taking my cartoons around, and I got work, uh, the National Lampoon, um, and also the Village Voice. I started selling to the Village Voice. And then I thought, well, I might as well try the New Yorker. My parents subscribed. I knew they used cartoons. I was sure they weren't going to take anything, so I wasn't nervous, you know. I w didn't quite know how to do this because the other places I could meet with the art director, the New Yorker wasn't like that. You had to bring in all your stuff, drop it off, and pick it up the next week. So I put everything in an envelope. I had like 60 cartoons I didn't know. Um, and I went back the next week, and instead of the rejection note, there was a note from Lee Lorenz, who was the uh, cartoon, uh, the art editor, actually. He did everything. He did the cartoons, he did the spots, he did the covers. 
Um, this was in April of 1978. And uh, he said, come back. He, it, there was a note. It just said, come see me, Lee. And I still remember because it was this loopy handwriting. So I got buzzed in. And um, they pulled out a cartoon. They said, we're going to buy this cartoon. And I, wanna, I want you to keep coming back every week. So that was it. Um, and um, I've, I, that's essentially what I've been doing uh, since I was 23, um, except I don't go in in person now. I send it electronically. But I still submit every week, yeah. Um, I'm wondering um, what the culture was like there for women. Did you feel like you fit in? Was there a sense of camaraderie for you? Had you found your people? I've never felt like I fit in anywhere. Uh, as a woman, I felt like I had so many peculiar things about me. I was younger by 10 years than the next youngest person there. I was the only woman. There was a woman from Israel who came in every once in a while, Nareet Carlin. Um, but aside from her, I was generally the only girl there. Um, and my stuff was just so weird compared to what most of these people were doing, except for maybe Jack Siegler, who was a little bit of a sort of a ground, not a little bit, he was a lot of a groundbreaker. I mean, he did cartoons with titles. He was playing with the form a little more than some of these people who were just, you know, they had their desk joke, they had their end of the world joke, they had their, you know, generals with like all the, they had their joke genres. And Jack Ziegler, uh, I, he was making up some new genres. So there were a lot of um, problems, you might say. Uh, well, problems with like the older guys like looking at me as a, like an outsider. Not just uh, being female was almost the least of it. So how did you deal with that? Um, I didn't care, you know. Um, I didn't socialize with them. Um, I thought, well, you know, Lee likes my stuff. And I remember Lee telling me, Sean really likes your work. I did not know who Sean was. I didn't know anything, you know. Um, I thought it was a first name. And all I could think of was Sean Connery. And I knew it was not Sean Connery. But he said it like it was a good thing. So I was like, oh, uh, that's good. Mr. Sean, William Sean, was the uh, editor-in-chief of The New Yorker for uh, many decades. There was Harold Ross, then there was William Sean. Um, and I came in uh, when William Sean was still the editor. So when Lee Lorenz told me that Sean really liked my work, that was a good Thing. And I knew from his tone of voice it was good. I just didn't know who Sean was. Because, you know, queen of the ignoramuses, or ignorami. So how does it work, Roz? You're, like, you're going through life, and then you get hit with a thought of, oh, there's a cartoon. Or tell me about that process. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, cartoons. Um, I don't know. I guess it's seeing some things as funny, um, having funny, funny thoughts sometimes, like things that make you laugh. Uh, I, I don't know. It's very hard to explain. Um, well, let's try it this way. Like, let's say I was living in your head. <laughs> you don't want that. Trust me. <laughs> and. And something strikes you, because it's not always funny. I mean, some of your cartoons aren't funny. They're, they're, they can be sad, and they can be moving in, in other directions than, than just straight out humor. Um, I think, I mean, the book that I wrote about my parents was definitely, there were some very sad things. But I hope that the cartoons that appear in The New Yorker they're generally, you know, things that while I'm drawing, while I'm working on my batch, as we call it, um, that, like, I think, oh, this is funny, you know. 
Um, I, the cartoon that's um, in the New Yorker this week is, um, it's called What Holds the Subway Together? Because I, I do love the New York subway. I mean, I think it's amazing that it actually works. But let's put it this way. It looked decrepit when I was a teenager. And that was a while ago. And it's not really gotten better. There may be like a brand new station with a Chuck Close mural in it. But in general, like you're standing on the platform and you see like black gook kind of like leaking down from where the ceiling and the wall join. And you think, that I don't think that's good. You know, I don't think that's a plus. Uh, you know, and then the rat sort of scurries along. And I don't mind rats, but I know that they're probably chewing on things, like wires and things. Um, so uh, anyway, so what holds the subway together? So I was thinking, OK, well, you know, you got your, um, your, your duct tape and bakery twine. You got to have your bakery twine. Um, and I forget something else. And then um, the last thing is enchantments. And there's like a wizard kind of like just tapping his, tapping the tile wall, which has all this like gluck kind of like dripping down. And he has, of course, a wizard outfit on and, and the, the wand with the star. And, um, you know, because I thought, well, a lot of times it really is kind of like positive thinking. Like, this station looks like it's about to collapse on me, but maybe it won't tonight. You know, because I'm on my way to meet a friend for dinner, and I just can't have that. You know, not tonight. So, you're quoted as saying that your cartoons are not autobiographical, but life is. But my life is always reflected in them. Yeah. Which is interesting, considering how much you don't really like to talk about yourself. You tell us actually so much about your life through your art. Yeah, I think it does go back to you draw what you know. Some cartoons come from um, the cartoon universe. You know, there's like the end of the world guys and desk jokes, and I just sold a desk joke this week. And um, there's all these different genres, um, tunnel of love jokes. Uh, oh, I don't know. There's like several dozen. Uh, cartoon genres. Um, and then there's cartoons that come more directly from life. Um, and some come quite, quite directly. Uh, when, I was, when my son was getting married, um, I was shopping for a dress to wear to the wedding. And I went with a friend to uh, this mall near where I live in Connecticut. And um, we went to the fancy dress, um, mother of the groom sort of area. And one dress was more hilarious than another. We were laughing so hard that snot and tears. It was just hysterical, these dresses. They were like little bolero jackets with like sequins on them and horrible colors, just like, you know, Ladies of a certain age, do you want to look really bad? Do you want to look dead? You know, check out this like weird blush color or light blue doesn't have to be pretty. It can be really bad. It's, you know, do you know a landlord that got like a whole bunch of free light blue paint from like some like out of business company from 1940? That's the dress for you, you know, matching sequins matching hat and we were just holding the dresses up and and dying so I wound up doing a cartoon about that would you wind up buying sorry would you wind oh up wearing? A, not a mother of the bride dress I found um, just a nice dress that was it was black but it had little flowers on it so and I've worn it I've worn it actually to the club so you know, you've probably seen it. It's a, it, you could, I can wear it. It's not bizarre. Many of the cartoons speak to an obsessiveness and draw from a range of images and language to create a whole world. How would you finish this sentence? I draw a world where... I draw a world where... 
there's people living in it and they sometimes say funny or ridiculous things and uh, wear sort of funny things and um, things have a certain kind of look like a lamp, uh, a coffee table, you know, it'll have like stuff on it. Um, and it's not like an architectural digest world. Uh, it's not, um, it's, you know, I feel like there are so many cartoonists that have worlds. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, Charles Saxon drew a certain world of upper middle class white uh, America. Golf, pants, and these ladies. And Helen Hokanson certainly had a world of her club ladies. My mother always said that these ladies, you know, had bosoms like the prow of a ship, and then they would taper down to these teensy tiny little feet, and they always wore like a little hat, and they were always going to like garden club meetings. Um, and of course, George Price had his world, and George Booth, and Ed Corrin, and uh, Mary Petty, and I think those are the cartoons that, and Charles Adams, I mean, duh. Those are the cartoons that I love, you know, where um, the cartoons that you see, they're like snapshots from a world that this person has created. It's not just like some generic, you know, goggle-eyed people with like, this like generic kind of funny gag. And that's, all, that's all another thing. I'm not saying there's something wrong with it. I'm just saying that it's not something I care that much about. That almost is like a service industry job to me. Like, you know, people are in a hurry. They don't want to like, uh, you know, they just want kind of like a fast gag line and like, blah, 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 you know, and fine, that's great. But it doesn't, I'm not interested. What does interest me is, uh, are the cartoonists who create a world. Um, and, and the gags come out of that world. And everything uh, is part of that world. You know, you're not going to see George Booth's characters um, like making a, a Charles Saxon joke. It just wouldn't make any sense. As an only child, watching your parents grow old had to have been pretty tough for you, in spite of how difficult they were as parents. It's still really hard to watch. What did it teach you about aging? How hard it is, how, uh, how awful in many ways. You know, once you get past that point of, um, you know, Centrum Silver aging, um, you know, the commercial side of like, you know, old people sort of squabbling and being their like cranky old person self. When you get dependent, when everything starts to just fall apart. And, uh, and also there's no, um, you're kind of on your own. I think that's one thing that I learned, especially being an only child, you know, I did not have brothers and sisters uh, to turn to. And um, it just sort of sucked. It was horrible. Um, and I know that speaks a lot to my own, you know, probably lack of compassion and selfishness. I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, it's awful. Uh, getting old is terrible. You know, once you become dependent on other people. And, uh, and, you know, things really become very painful. And also I learned, you know, the, the, it almost starts to tip into black comedy how expensive it is and how n much you get nickeled and dimed and how nothing is covered. Things that... Um, you know, one would think would be covered. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Oh, and then I learned, um, you know, my parents uh, lived in Brooklyn, and um, they had been paying into a health care plan from their teaching years 
their entire lives. But you know, I learned that when they moved to uh, an assisted living place in Connecticut at the last couple of years of their lives to be near me, um, their insurance did not cross state lines. So there were all kinds of, you learn about rules like that um, that don't make it any easier. It's just crazy. It's just crazy, sad, uh, terrible. How did you deal with your own grief? I think this is going to sound horrible. As I said, I'm not like the most compassionate person. In many ways, I was relieved. They were, my father was 95. Um, he was ready to go. He had broken his hip. And uh, he told me, he said, he said he was ready. He, was, he felt like he had had a good life. Um, my mother was still alive at that point. He was surrounded. My, um, you know, my kids were there. It was, it was OK. Um, my mother lived until she was 97. And the last couple of years were not good. I have grief about a lot of things, but not grief about the fact that they died, you know? Where does the grief show up then? Uh, the grief is that uh, my mother and I couldn't have had a better relationship, but that goes so far back. Uh, you know, it probably goes back to before I was born. So that's just, um, you know, I think that's another thing that I learned that, um, oh, I learned a lot from, you know, when my parents were dying. I, um, I learned that death can be a very quick process, but it can also be really drawn out. Um, I also learned that unlike the movies or in TV where are these, you know, deathbed sort of re reconciliations, that doesn't always happen. You know, um, so you're kind of left with, well, that did not happen. So, mm, you know. I read that your next book is going to be about dreams. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. What is it about dreams that fascinates you? <sighs> dreams. Oh. I don't know what they are. Uh, I don't know what dreams are. I don't know why we have them. There's a lot of theories, but I think the jury is still out. Freud says this, Jung says that, uh, the Kabbalah says this, the Egyptians say that. Um, there's scientists have all different theories about, you know, neuron boot camp, that it's actually teaching your brain what how to think. Um, there's dreaming to remember, dreaming to forget, dreaming to the predictive dreams. There's all different reasons. Um, they're also so peculiar. When I write my dreams down, I am imposing my conscious, awake sense of narrative onto the dream. I, I don't think I could replicate in words what a dream I don't think we have language for what a dream feels actually feels like. It's another state of consciousness. Why so. do you want to write a book about them? Uh, I just find dreams extremely interesting. When you look at your life, I mean, you're still really, really young. But, <laughs> but, but I mean, you oh. know, we just talked to Betty, who's 30 years older than you. and. But when you look at your life, what do you feel the overarching um, wisdom comes from for you? Where do you feel that you've learned the most? Um, I think it's really important to figure out what you love, to have something that deeply, deeply engages you. And uh, hopefully it's something that can be there for your entire life, you know? I mean, I've often thought, God, I'm so lucky I'm not a dancer or something like that. Uh, because drawing and writing, you know, I might not 
be great at like lifting a lithography stone, you know, but you can make somebody do that for you, I suppose. But it's not like being a dancer or something where your body is, you know, or an actress where, you know, there's that, uh, you know, you, you're limited by your appearance and what roles you can do. So, yeah, and, and that is something that I did get from my parents, the knowing from a very, you know, that it was important to not just, you know, do whatever, but um, to have a passion. I mean, for my father, it was languages. He loved foreign languages. I mean, he taught, but even after he retired, he was still deeply involved with all of that and belonged to a French group and, you know, a French poetry group and a French playwriting group. My mother, it was music and also teaching. You know, so they had their things that they loved. But with everything that you learned from your parents, what was, it most, what was most important for you to give to your children? What I really wanted my children to understand was that it was important to find something in life that you loved to do, and not necessarily for money, um, although, you know, if that's what you wanted to do, then that's great too, but that to sort of go with the flow in that way. It was like, if you love to sing, then, and you should do that because the more you sing, the better you're going to get at it. And I think that with children, you can see this, like there's going to be kids who, you know, they love music and then they get to be, you know, the musical kid in the class and they get, you know, good feedback for that and then that makes them want to do it more and then it just sort of builds on it. Um, so I, I did feel for my kids that it was very important to find out what they loved, to fi find out what, you know, what gave them pleasure to do, you know. What about human connection? What about who they loved? Did you feel like you had something to teach them about that or? Mm. <laughs> human connection, that's uh, not been my strong suit maybe. Um, maybe from being an only child and spending so much time by myself. Uh, I think in some ways I've learned, especially from my younger kid, more about that. He, uh, he's a therapist. Um, no, no. They were more on their own for that. <laughs> uh, okay. And what do you want old age to look like for you? Oh, I'd like, I hope I'm still drawing and writing. Um, that's how I, you know, when I think about older age and getting into my even older age than I am now, I, I just really want to keep working. I want to keep drawing, um, not just drawing cartoons, but doing art projects, because that's what I do. I mean, I, I have all kinds of art projects that I'm working on. I, I do embroidery, you know, these funny canvases and, um, Pisanki eggs and hooking rugs and I really want to do printmaking and I'm book binding and um, and I love putting books together and you know I, art projects that's what I I want to keep doing my whole life is art projects that's so great and Raz um, one question that we're sort of asking people is that the importance of, of storytelling of lives you know this is you use your cartoons to, to tell life stories. How important is it, do you think, to have storytelling about lives? I think storytelling is, is extremely important. Uh, I think storytelling is how we make sense of things and how sometimes, uh, you know, it can be a, you can rationalize things, you know, sometimes for better or for worse. Storytelling connects things and, uh, and helps you connect with other people, I think. You know, it's sort of the opposite of um, like 40 minutes of, you know, static and then writing an incomprehensible paper about architectonics, you know. Um, 
it's kind of like, well, I'm here. I don't really know why. I don't know how I got here. I don't know where I'm going from here, although I, I do know I'm, I'm going to take the one down to 72nd Street after this. Um, but <laughs> in general, um, you know, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. And um, sometimes things are funny, and sometimes things are very, you know, sad or frustrating. Sometimes they're just stupid and boring. Um, and, uh, you know, this is what I think, and what do you think? You know, what do you think about? So, um, and also with storytelling, some of it is, is craft and shaping. It's like, you know, nobody wants to listen to somebody, like, tell a story, and it's like, and then I walked down the stairs, and then there was a piece of paper on the stairs, and then there was, I saw this boy, da, 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 da. You know, you're kind of making a story so that you can, you know, it's empathy for the other person who's listening, I think, also. That's, I mean, a sto good storytelling has a lot to do with empathy, I think. You know, you've, we've all seen those uh, vanity press kind of books where somebody is just, like, telling uh, their life of, like, how they were, like, head of, like, Acme Incorporated, and it's just, like, oh, or somebody who just, I mean, that's my fear of, you know, doing this is, like, ugh, am I, like, droning on, am I, like, you know, droning in this way. It's empathy um, for telling a story in an, not lying, but telling a story in a way that um, you're thinking about the person listening a little bit, you know.